ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ابو هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه he said i heard the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that my example and the example of the rest of the people is like the example of a man who lit a fire he lit a fire and when that fire it caught and it lit everything around it the moths and the insects they started to fly into that fire they started to rush into that fire and we know that this is the case because they are attracted by the light and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam continued and he said the man tried his best to prevent them he tried his best to prevent them from rushing into the fire but they overpowered him they overpowered him and they rushed into the fire and then the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam continued and he said just like that i am taking hold of your waistbands meaning i'm taking hold of you and i'm trying my best to prevent you from falling into the fire but you insist on falling into it This is an amazing example ikhwani fillah this is an amazing an amazing similitude that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam set up that the moths they are attracted by the light and they don't realize that the light that they are flying towards and that they are so attracted to is a fire and when they fly towards it what's going to happen they're going to be destroyed but their love of this light and this innate desire to go towards it it causes their own destruction and the man is doing his best to stop whatever he can but they're just overpowering him and just going in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying this is my example this is my example i'm trying my best to keep you back from the fire but you're just overpowering me and you're insisting on running and falling into the fire ikhwani fillah from this we learn that the speech the actions the tacit approvals in other words the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the overriding purpose of it is to prevent the slave of allah from falling into the fire is to prevent the slave of allah from his own destruction and so when we find something from the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have to then recognize it's there for a reason it's there for my own benefit and there is goodness in it even if sometimes we might not be able to see that so having said that aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she said that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to fast until we thought he would never break his fast and then he would not fast until we would thought he would never fast so it was from the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there were times when he would fast for long periods of time and then he would take a break sometimes sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then she continued and she said i never saw the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasting an entire month except for the month of ramadan and i never saw him fast more than he did 
in the month of Sha'ban. And this is the month that we are in now. The month of Sha'ban, we're in the fifth or the sixth of the month of Sha'ban, is the month which precedes the blessed month of Ramadan. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who knows the actions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and his habits, who knows them better than his own wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She said that I never saw the Messenger of Allah fasting, meaning in any other month outside of the month of Ramadan, I never saw him fasting more than he did in the month of Sha'ban. And so from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to fast in this month. And Ikhwani Fillah, Usama Ibn Zayd, may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala be pleased with them both. He said, O Messenger of Allah, I do not see you fasting in any other month like you do in the month of Sha'ban. Meaning I don't see you fasting that much. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that is a month between the month of Rajab and the month of Ramadan, which the people, they do not pay attention to. And it is a month in which the deeds, they are lifted up to the Lord of the worlds. And I like for my deeds to be lifted up whilst I am fasting. And so this is one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ would fast so much in this month. That in this month, the deeds are lifted up in a way which Allah wa Taala knows best. They're lifted up to Allah, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted that whilst his deeds were being lifted up and presented to Allah, that he is fasting. Another wisdom that the scholars they mention is that Sha'ban is a training ground for the month of Ramadan. Sha'ban. The fasting that a person does in the month of Sha'ban, it gets him ready for the month of Ramadan. And we all know those first two weeks or so, or the first 10 days of Ramadan, our fasting, we really feel it. And it really takes its toll on us. And it affects us. Some people, their mood is affected. Some people, they become, they have a very short fuse in the month of Ramadan. They have less sabr than they normally would. And that's because we're not used to fasting. That's an indication of that. And so if you fast in the month of Sha'ban, then this will prepare you for the month of Ramadan. If you increase in your obedience to Allah in this month, whilst our deeds are being presented to him, then inshallah, you will have an easy entry into the blessed month of Ramadan. Why do we fast, my brothers, on the eve of the month of Ramadan? Why do we fast? Allah says, Fasting has been prescribed for you, just as it was prescribed for those who came before you, in order that you obtain taqwa, that you become from the people of taqwa. And this, is not just about fearing Allah. So many times when we hear about taqwa, we just think it's about fear of Allah. Let's look at what Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he answered. He was asked by a man, what is taqwa, O oh, Abu Huraira? Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the great companion of the Messenger of Allah, he said, have you ever taken a thorny path have you ever walked down a path where there's lots of thorns and stinging nettles alongside it and upon it? The man said, yes. Abu Huraira said, what did you do? When you walked on that path, what did you do? The man said, if I saw the thorns, I would avoid them, or I would pass over them, or I would stop short of them. Abu Huraira said, that is taqwa. That is taqwa. That you are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you do what you are commanded and you abstain from what you are forbidden from. And some of the scholars they mentioned, it is to put between yourself and Allah's punishment, put a barrier. And that barrier is your obedience to Allah. And some of the scholars they would mention, it's to act in obedience to Allah, being guided by a light, being guided by Allah, hoping in the mercy of Allah and 
to stay away from the disobedience of Allah, from a light from Allah, being guided by Allah, hoping to stay away or fearing the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the mu'min, the Muslim, the believer, he is somebody who he worships Allah with hope, but also with fear. And ikhwani fillah, if we fear Allah in this world, Allah won't allow us to fear on Yawm al Qiyamah. But if we feel secure from Allah and we feel no fear in this world, Allah will cause fear upon us on Yawm al Qiyamah. Abu Hurairah ta'ala anhu, he reported that the Prophet وسلم, said, By my might, I will not combine two fears or two safeties upon my slave. If he fears me in this world, I will assure his safety in the hereafter. But if he feels safe from me in this world, then he will fear me on the day of resurrection. And so Ikhwani Fillah, these two states, they will never be combined. Two fears will never be combined. Two safeties will never be combined. If you fear here, you will have safety over there. If you feel safe and you just become lax and lazy here, you will have fear over there. And so the clever person and the wise person, the intellectual person is the one who fears Allah here because he knows that that day is a day which won't ever come to an end. There's no end, there's no death after this first death. And so Ikhwani Fillah, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, anhuma, he sought permission to enter upon Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she was on the verge of death. She was in the pangs and the pains of death. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she didn't want to let him in because she said, I fear that he will praise me. I fear that he will praise me. But they said, he is the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is a prominent Muslim, he's a scholar. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, give him permission to enter. Ibn Abbas, when he entered, he said, how are you? How do you find yourself? Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I am good if I fear Allah. I am in a good state if I fear Allah. Ibn Abbas, he said, you are good. You are good, inshallah. You're the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't marry any virgin except for yourself. Your innocence was revealed from above the heavens. You're in a good state, inshallah. Aisha, after Ibn Abbas, he left, Ibn Zubair entered upon her and she said, Ibn Abbas visited me and he praised me. I wish I was a thing which was forgotten. I wish I just didn't exist. And this is the taqwa of these people. This is from the taqwa of these people. She's in the pangs of death Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma says, how are you? She says, I'm good inshallah, as long as I have taqwa of Allah. As long as I have this fear of Allah in my heart, then I'm good. And she didn't want praise. She didn't want recognition. Even though she's the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mother of the believers, Allah has freed her from uh, that which was mentioned from above the seven heavens. She didn't want that praise. That's a person who has the fear of Allah in my heart, in their heart. The Prophet sallallahu also mentioned, there was a man from amongst the people who came before, who suspected his good deeds, meaning he didn't hold that his good deeds amounted to anything. He wasn't somebody who thought, mashallah, I've been on hajj and I've done X and Y. And he said, I don't have enough deeds. I'm going to meet Allah, I don't have enough deeds. Therefore, he said to his sons and he gathered his sons, if I die, take my body and burn my corpse, burn my body and throw the ashes into the sea or throw them out on a windy day so they just get blown all over the place. They did that. 
They respected the wishes of their father. They burnt him into ashes and they just spread the ashes. But Allah collected his particles and brought him back together. And then asked that man, what made you do what you did? What made you do what you did? What made you say that to your sons? He said, the only thing that made me do it, oh Allah, was that I was afraid of you. So Allah forgave him. This hadith is mentioned by Imam al-Bukhari. So the thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it when his slave is scared and fearful of him. But like I said, ikhwani fillah, it's not just about the fear of Allah. It's also about the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being balanced. Because if you are a person who just fears Allah and you have so much fear but no hope, you're not going to do any actions. You're going to feel, uh, you're going to lose hope. And you're going to think I'm finished. So it's like Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, it's like the two wings of a bird. They have to both be their equal. With regards to the mercy of Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Indeed, when Allah created mercy, the day he created it, he divided it into 100 parts and he kept back 99 parts and sent one part to all of his creatures. Had the non-believer, had the disbeliever known of all of the mercy which is in the hands of Allah, he would not lose hope of entering paradise and had the believer known of the punishment which is present with Allah, he would not consider himself safe from the hellfire. Meaning there is so much punishment, but at the same time, there's so much mercy as well. The mercy which we have on our children, the mercy which the mother has on her children, the mercy which the animals have on each other is as a result of that one part of mercy. And Allah has kept back 99 parts for him, for the believers on Yawm al -Qiyam. So inshallah we have a hope in attaining the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the next hadith I'm going to read to you in the next part of this khutbah. It's a wondrous hadith. It's a hadith which describes the dream of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it gives us hope. And there is some discussion onto the authenticity of this hadith. Ibn Taymiyyah he graded authentic. Shaykh al-Albani said it was weak, but Ibn Taymiyyah said no, but it contains things which are mentioned from the usul of the sunnah anyway. So even if the hadith is wrong, the, mean, the, the chain is incorrect, the meaning is correct. But it's a hadith which we should ponder over. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن ولا عبد الرحمن بن سمرة he reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came out to us and he said indeed I saw something wondrous last night I I saw an amazing thing last night meaning in the dream I saw a man of my nation and the angels were holding him back and his ablution came and saved him from that. I saw a man of my nation who was surrounded by the shayateen and the dhikr of Allah came and freed him from that. I saw a man of my nation suffering from extreme thirst, extreme thirst and his fasting in the month of Ramadan came and saved him from that. I saw a man of my nation with darkness in front of him and darkness behind him, darkness to his right, darkness to his left, darkness above him, darkness below him. And his pilgrimages came and they took him out of that darkness. I saw a man whom the angel of death came to take his soul and his good treatment of his parents came and took him out from that. <coughs> I saw a man of my nation to whom the believers would not speak and his maintenance of family ties. They came and they said, he is one who has maintained the family ties, so speak to him. 
and he became one of them. I saw a man of my nation who came to the people sitting in circles and every circle drove him away and his ghusl when he was in a state of ritual impurity it came and it led him by his hand and it seated him next to them. I saw a man from my I saw a man shielding his face from the heat of the hellfire and his sadaqa came and it gave him shade to cover his face. I saw a man of my nation to whom the angels of punishment they came and his enjoining of the good and his forbidding of the evil came and it saved him from that. I saw a man of my nation falling into the hellfire and the tears which he shed, the tears which he shed out of the fear of Allah and the reverence of Allah came to pull him out of the hellfire. I saw a man of my nation whose scroll fell into his left hand and his fear of Allah came and placed that scroll in his right hand. I saw a man from my nation swaying in the wind like a palm tree and his good thoughts of Allah came and they controlled his shaking. I saw a man from my nation crawling across the sirat over the hellfire, the bridge. At times he was kneeling, at times he was clinging to it and his blessings over me, his saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came, they took him by his hand and they stood him up and they uh, passed over the bridge like that. I saw a man of my nation who was stopped at the gates of paradise and every gate of Jannah was locked for him and his shahada, his testimony of la ilaha illallah came and it led him into the paradise. Like I said, ikhwani fillah, there is discussion about the authenticity of this hadith, but the meanings are correct. That there are so many avenues bi idnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala that we can get into Jannah. There are so many good deeds that we can do and we don't know which one of our deeds will lead us into Jannah. There are so many acts that we can do and we don't know what will save us on Yom Al-Qiyam. But what we do know is that the believers will have mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yom Al-Qiyam. But we also know that there will be people from the believers who will enter into the fire of hell. So my brother, don't rely on the mercy of Allah and forget about the punishment of Allah. Don't fool yourself and think for me is mercy because nobody has promised me or you mercy. We may be from those people who enter into the fire. May Allah protect us. And so this is the time, my brothers, to, pre to prepare ourselves for the month of Ramadan. This is the time to get into the right frame of mind. This is the time to get onto our prayers, to start reading the Quran, to start the fasting, because none of us has been promised that he will reach the month of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to reach the month of Ramadan, that he allows us to maximize that, and that we maximize this month of Sha'ban as well, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us for our sins and grants us جنة الفردوس الأعلى سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Establish the prayer